Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual PATHI lecture. Uh, my name is PJ Carefoot. I'm the head of the Department of Rare Books and Special Collections here at the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the land in which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Many of you as donors, I know, uh, will know that the initiatives of the Thomas Fisher Rare Book Library have featured prominently, very prominently, in the success of the university's $2.4 billion boundless campaign. I am very pleased to have the chance to thank you sincerely once again for your contributions, which nurture collections and services for our students, faculty, and our researchers. If you would like to know more about how you can support the library through the Boundless Campaign, my colleague, Megan Campbell, who is at the back, will be very, very happy to speak with you. <laughs> so welcome, very warm welcome to this year's second Friends of the Fisher Library Lectures. We are so pleased to have Mr. Alex Pathy, there he is, Mr. Alex Pathy with us this evening for this, the 19th annual Pathy Lecture. Tonight's presenter is Mr. Wesley Bates. Mr. Bates is a son of the Yukon, but he was raised in southwestern Saskatchewan. And after leaving Mount Allison University, he subsequently moved to Hamilton, Ontario, where he pursued a career as a painter and a printmaker. In 1981, he began work as a wood engraver and freelance illustrator. Primarily known for his work as a wood engraver, Mr. Bates has worked for many major publishing houses and has illustrated books by such authors as W. O. Mitchell, Wendell Berry, Ed McClanahan, Richard Taylor, Stuart McLean, and Timothy Finley. He now lives and works in Clifford, Ontario, and we have the great pleasure of hearing him speak this evening on The Color in Black. Mr. Bates. Oh, I thought it was going to be single malt. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Pardon me while I just do this. Um, we have two kinds of um, solvent in my print shop. One's called Varsol and the other's called McClellan's. So, Got to keep ourselves standing up somehow. Um, I just want to thank the the Pathé family for having this lecture series and for um, inviting me along. I'd also like to thank PJ Carefoot, who you just saw, uh, for inviting me here tonight. And also David Fernandez, who's one of the Rare Book Librarians. He's been my main contact through this whole uh, pre preparations. John Shoesmith, who uh, is your outreach librarian and he's been uh, an acquaintance of mine for a while and uh, made sure that all of this worked. I sent, I sent a bunch of raw stuff and they actually got it to work. And Liz Rodolfo, who's uh, just sort of looking after the minutia of somebody who doesn't know where they are. Actually, I have some sense of where I am. This is a lot bigger than the library in Clifford, I have to tell you. <laughs> Clifford's about a thousand people. So uh, you guys have a lot of books. Um, so, the title, The Color of Black. Uh, in, a, in a world of marketing, sometimes you have to be a little bit uh, provocative and you have to kind of poke at people a little bit. So that's partly what I've done here with this title. But I hope to uh, elaborate and sort of fill in some of the, some of the um, questions that people might be having about what that means. What we have here... Um, it's just a page of text. It's um, a page from a book called Emblemata Amatoria, published by Aliquando Press. And Will Reuter is the sole proprietor, type washer, and cook at that press. And um, I just want us to think about this for just a minute or two as a, as a page of text. Many years ago, I attended a talk um, through the Typocrafters organization. 
um, and the designer was uh, talking about a page and he talked about the color of a page of text. I looked at the, that was fairly green, I looked at that page and um, it was black type on a virtually white sheet of paper and I thought I understood what the designer was saying and I regretted for many years not asking for a more in-depth um, explanation. The meaning of a, the color of a page of text has haunted me ever since and, I've, and I was for many years trying to understand it as having color. Color theory as it pertains to light says that white is the presence of all color and that black is the absence of color. And color theory with regards to pigments says that white is the absence of color and that black is the presence of all color. And I remember at school, uh, or my mother even telling me that, uh, just mix all the colors that you have on your palette and you'll get something that's close to black. But looking back now at what the designer meant, I now see that the color of a page of text has a nuanced meaning referring to the effect of type inhabiting the surface of a page. Typefaces, character, its texture, its balance, its spatial relationships amongst the characters and the lines, the tone and the overall attractiveness to the eye. There are pages that glare at you as if in full sunlight and make the reader squint. There are others that become soporific in a kind of twilight hue thinking of those textbooks we all had to read and put our face into to sleep properly. And then there are those pages that speak to us through a clear afternoon kind of light as if we're underneath a shade tree. Those are the pages that, that bring you through the text that you're reading. Um, Will is a very fine book designer. He was the head designer at University of Toronto Press for many years. So I didn't really spend much time looking for a page in his oeuvre because uh, they're all good. But this, just the idea of how the marks on a page um, and their association and um, just the overall effect, the designer was saying had a, he called it a color. It's interesting how we're attracted to a text even when we know nothing about the meaning of the author's words. Is this mic being a bit too rambunctious? Can, and can you all hear me? Can you hear me at the back? Okay. Nope, I should speak up a little bit louder even. <laughs> you have a gentle voice. Let okay. Little, let me get in here too. I'm going to turn you up. Okay. Okay, try it now. The, well, here we go. All right. I'll leave here myself. Um, it's interesting. That's too loud. That's too loud. Yep. I think. Okay. Use the. Use this. Yeah. Okay. okay. Try again. Okay. Now, can you hear me at the back now? Can you hear me, John? Okay. Um, it's interesting to know how we're attracted to a text even when we don't know the meaning of the author's words. We are attracted to the page by the designer's use of the elements of design type, face, point, size, length of, of line, character weight, margins, and spacing. And all of those can make or break a book in about two minutes when you're looking at it in the bookstore. You can say, I'm not interested in this, whatever this book's about. And it may be a fascinating book, but it just doesn't, it just wasn't designed properly. The color wasn't right. In each of the 750,000 books that rise above you here in the Thomas Fisher collection, there was an orchestra of artisans that made that book happen. The authors, binders, typesetters, type makers, paper makers, designers of type, book designers, printers, just only to acknowledge a few. And oh, let's not forget the artists who add the illustrations. <laughs> If there's two 
illustrations per book, which I think is probably being conservative. Um, and that's what we're doing these days, is being conservative. Um, there's probably a million and a half illustrations that rise above you in this beautiful space. So it's a, it's a thing I feel like I'm kind of representing in my own way, the countless artists and illustrators whose work accompany the texts here. The author of the book is a composer, but I like to think of the artist as a soloist. And if they get to do a lot, they get to be the guest soloist. Um, I hope that's in focus, that people can see that properly. Um, this is an engraving of mine called The Collector. Um, I've come to understand the color black as it pertains to my work as a wood engraver because what makes a page of text have color is the same for a wood engraving. The relationship of black and white lines and marks, the direction of the lines, the fluidity and the grace of line, the texture, the balance of light and dark and middle tone, and the crispness of the image. These are the artist's alphabet that bring the content of the image to the viewer. Um, in this particular situation, I was uh, asked to, this was for a cover of a, an Ameri a British journal called Parentheses, and um, they wanted an illustration that was going to sort of hint at the different articles that were in, uh, in that particular issue. They had articles on um, early type faces or early type forms, letter forms, it should say. The thing, that little uh, letter form up in the upper left-hand corner and I think this was old, very early, uh, in, in somewhere in England. I've forgotten what the typefaces, what the letter forms are called. There was also uh, books on insects, and that was a lot of fun. There was uh, several articles on, on uh, photography, and then there was one on the printing, the actual printing process of stamps in the early days. So I just tried to blend them all together <laughs> in a bit of a whirlwind. But the, the way that the marks are on the page, I was trying to, I'm trying to compare this, in, this engraving with Will's page of type. His was a lot calmer, and, um, but, this, but the, the um, relationship of all the marks create a color. It's not just the, the content of the image, it's not just the, what they call the design of the image, it's the, the actual spaces and elements of those, all those little marks that become the color of black. Now, before I go any further, I, I know I'm in a room with people who um, are very well educated in the world of books and things, but I'm, I'm going to bring Thomas Buick into it just because we just sort of have to set the, uh, have to set the tone, proper tone for the rest of this. I mean, I feel like I'm in a cathedral, so we've got to talk about Buick. So this is um, a portrait by John Jackson, who did the, uh, who created a big treatise on the on the art of wood engraving. He was uh, an apprentice of Buick's for a short while, um, and Buick lived from 1753 to 1828, and he's credited with inventing wood engraving, a leap of imagination that made him sort of the Steve Jobs of his day. His invention revolutionized publishing, the publishing world at the time, and the wood engraving became the go-to method for placing images alongside type for about 100 years. There's actually some debate over crediting Buick with the invention, but his remark, remarkable body of work and the innovation of the medium usually has those who debate his authorship conceding the point. <coughs> <laughs> um, see what I mean about things? We kind of have to poke people a little bit here and there. Um, Buick, Buick grew up in, on the banks of the Tyne River in Northumberland, uh, not far from Newcastle, north of, in the central part of England. Buick became a tradesman wood engraver, or metal engraver with an established business in Newcastle. But his early life along the river 
and in the countryside established for him a lifelong love of natural history and the pleasures of country life. In those late seven years of the late 1700s, the popular form of illustration that was used to illustrate texts was mostly uh, either etching or metal engraving. Here's a metal engraving in the art of cookery made plain and easy, published in 1747. So in the Buick's uh, business was as a metal engraver, he didn't do illustrations, he engraved things like silver platters and uh, place, pla um, you know, those beautiful brass plaques that go on the outsides of buildings and business cards and calling cards and things like that would have been a... But on the side, he did his own work. Um, he also illustrated um, uh, with, with er his early uh, forays into wood engraving were um, a book on um, mathematics and algebra, I think it is. I've seen uh, examples of you know, um, how to measure the height of a building from a, from a distance and things like that. Um, wood engra uh, woodcuts were a kind of passe at the time and they weren't used, they were used in sort of the lower grade uh, publishing like children's books like this one. Um, wood, woodcut had had quite a, a long run uh, before and then as um, etching and metal engraving became more popular they were kind of shoved to the side. But Buick wanted to pursue his interest in natural history and he, um, he set out um, to illustrate uh, a catalog of quadrupeds. And it wasn't just the quadrupeds of his neighborhood, it was the quadrupeds of the world. It was a, it was a big deal. And it was eventually published in 1790. And to accomplish this project, he needed to reduce the cost. And so he chose to use wood engraving. By adapting his metal engraving tools and using uh, wood by making hardwood blocks with the engraving surface, the end grain surface, as opposed to the side grain surface that's used in woodcut, and also milling the end grain block to the same height as type, he was able to place the type and the illustration in the same press and therefore eliminate one press operation and cut his cost significantly. So the, the advent of wood engraving was a, sort of the, um, the child of the mother of invention in a way, just to, a way to make things less expensive. And his book on quadrupeds um, shows the point where the illustration and the text were printed together. Um, I've never heard of this kind of animal before. <laughs> but uh, anyway, this, this would have been, this is from a, a facsimile book that I have. I, I bet you there's the real deal in this place somewhere. And it'd uh, be kind of fun to see that someday. Anyway, um, it, was a, it was a project that took him in uh, approximately 10 years to, to produce. And he was working from the animals that he knew. The, the best illustrations, people often say, are the, are the English dogs, English cattle, and English horses. He really did have a straight-ahead uh, idea of who they, what they were. But things like, uh, creatures like this one were probably either, he was working from a taxidermy uh, sample, or uh, written descriptions that uh, the sailors that come back from the, from the empire would uh, have with them. And this is one of um, Buick's um, illustrations for the, his history of British birds. The first, it was, it was published in two editions. The first edition in 1797 and the second one in 1804. The first one was land, land birds and the second one was water birds. They also published a supplement in 1821. So the British birds became his masterpiece. Now he was dealing with, uh, with birds in their, in their uh, habitat and how he knew them quite well. He was very, he was very in tune with birds. And it's highly regarded for its accuracy in the engravings of the birds. And it was the, it's considered to be the first common field guide. It was a 25-year project altogether and only finished a few years before his death. In, in his quadrupeds and in his birds, 
he added tail pieces that weren't necessarily uh, about the subject of the books. They were his private um, medium to, of his own personal expression. He was an avid fisherman, so this is one of those, but uh, the previous one was also one of his ways of expressing his point of view about country life and people's, uh, the way they live their lives. And um, historians and anthropologists look at two Buick's tailpieces uh, for information of that time period in the area that he lived. Um, they all seem to be focused in the Tyne Valley and Newcastle area. And uh, they're very narrative and lots of them are, lots of humor and most of them are pastoral. Now, the color of black, I'm going to, now I'm going to have to perform a trick on you. And um, it, it, uh, you don't have to do anything, you just have to come along with me when you think about it. Uh, think about wood engravings. This is, and this is very much what we're about to do, is about what wood engraving is really about. It's black that brings the image to the page. I wish I had a wand. But, but what's happening here is, so I'm going to say presto, and I'm going to ask you not to read the black, but instead, in this image, to read the white. It's actually the white in the image that creates the image. <clears throat> Conceptually, wood engraving is like drawing on a blackboard with chalk. To create an image, you create it by bringing in the light. Etchings and metal engravings and the lowly woodcut um, were all black line images in the, day that, in the days of Buick. And Buick's real gift to art is that he used his tools in the most natural way on the end grain block. The act of engraving lowers the surface and therefore creates a white mark when the surface is rolled with black ink. So the real color of a wood engraving is actually white on the page. And this is the reason I think that wood engraving is one of the best compliments to type and in a book. And it's the old, the old saying that opposites attract. So here we are back with the, uh, the creature that was in the page. And um, you can see that he's put the, the white substance in here is uh, what he probably would have called whiting. Um, sometimes it's chalk. I use cornstarch. And uh, it works a real treat. It's just excellent. And when you engrave and you put that in, it fills the lines with white and it actually shows you your engraving on the block which therefore reinforces the idea that it's the white that's telling the story. You've got to make sure that when you, before you put the block in the press, though, that you eliminate all the cornstarch because it thickens the ink like crazy. <laughs> so the thing that I wanted to show in this one, too, that the tools here are where, um, I'm to I, by the, where I got this reference from. They said they were Buick's tools. The metal engraving tools that he would have used on an everyday basis, um, the face of the tool, and we'll show you the face in a minute, um, the face of the tool would have been sharpened at about a 20 degree angle off parallel, off level. And in order to make it work in the wood, he changed the angle to a 45 degree angle, which makes it slip through the wood more effectively and more easily. So he didn't really change his tools all that much. And what's really interesting is that the tools that, uh, that I use, and my compatriot George Walker here tonight, um, the tools that we use are the same tools that Buick used. And we're using the wood in the same way that he used. Uh, we're applying the ink pretty much in the same way that he used. It's one of those mediums that is still um, pretty much uh, true to itself all of these years later. Um, things like uh, photography is not available to a wood engraver like it is in a, an etching or a metal engraving. You can etch the plates with the photography. Silkscreen can use photography. And there's um, 
so can lithography use photography. But wood engraving is still one of those things that you have to uh, sort of treat it the way Michelangelo did. It's, it's in there somewhere. You just got to dig it out. And, um, but the thing is that, so the face of the tool is this area here. And you can see that it's lying down more on a 45 degree angle than a 20 degree angle. The reason it can't lie down so low on metal is because that makes the tip more fragile. So there we go for that. So the same tools, and so before we go into my work and so on, I just wanted to make sure that I thank Mr. Buick, wherever he is in here, uh, for the medium that I feel that is the way I express myself the best. Whoops, went too fast. So this is what my engraving table looks like. And the little pot in the middle is my cornstarch. I was using um, things like talc at one point, but talc's a mineral, and I thought, well, I mean, one wouldn't, doesn't want to be breathing minerals all the time because it gets a little dusty there, but so I, I, I'm, I'm working with a food substance. So <laughs> I, I'll probably get Miller's lung. Anyway, um, the, uh, the, the, where this, the big brown thing in the center at the bottom is in, in a, a pad. It's very similar to the pad that metal engravers use. So he just brought basically his own. He probably didn't bring it anywhere. He just sat down at his normal desk and did the wood engraving right there. The pad is used to put the block on top of so that when you move, when you change the direction of the line, you turn the block, not the tool. And the... Um, what else? Uh, anyway, and then I just have my tools up in a in a rack there so that I can reach them more uh, easily. It's not a so good idea to have too many tools on the table because as they start clinking around and their points touch the sides of tools, you can take off the, the four or five molecules at the very tip, which makes a very blunt tool when you're trying to engrave. And uh, here's the engraving uh, at work. Um, so the hand that holds the tool basically operates what I call the dive of the tool. Most of the engraving tools are wedge-shaped so that when you put the tool into the wood, it starts off with a very fine mark, and then the deeper you allow the tool to go, the wider the line becomes. So some of the tools are very easy. You can get a very sort of ribbony kind of line, and others are a little blunter, so you get a sort of a stipple or a different kind of line. And then the other hand is what moves the block. So it's a bit like rubbing your tummy and patting your head. It's you kind of got to do the two things at the same time. Now, I often get asked what my influences are. And uh, I already mentioned the single malt. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, when I was a kid, my mother, my mother went to art school in New York. She went to the Art Students League there. And um, I... And, we, were, we moved a lot. Um, as, as Pierce said, I was raised in the prairies. My father was an RCMP officer, and we, um, in those days, they didn't let them settle anywhere. You had to be um, not of the community in order to police it. And um, so we had a very small library that traveled with us, and there, were, uh, there was a, 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 um, a twin set of books from the Heritage um, Press, our Heritage Club of Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights. And it was illustrated by um, Fritz Eichenberg, who's the engraver here. And uh, w whenever I was sick or it was raining outside or when my mother had to get me out of the kitchen, she'd tell me to go and look at some books. And uh, these were my favorites. I looked at them many times. I didn't read them. I just looked at the pictures. And after several years of looking at the pictures, you kind of got the gist, you know. <laughs> I'd rather listen to the soloist than the, than the whole orchestra, maybe. And... Um, Anyway, uh, so uh, I didn't really understand that when I started engraving that I was, had been influenced by Fritz Seikenberg all these years. I, went to, I was given some tools by my first wife um, and, uh, some block, and uh, a couple of blocks. And I didn't, when I was at university or art school, uh, we never talked about wood engraving. It was never, it was not part of the subject. Wood cuts, I majored in, uh, did a double major in painting and printmaking, and I was doing Japanese traditional, uh, in the traditional style of key blocks and then color blocks. And I was doing wood, wood cuts up to 14 color blocks. It was a big production for me. And I, when I got out of school, I thought it was just too, too
too fussy to uh, carry on with, so I just put all my printmaking stuff away and I painted and uh, tended bar and, and um, did drywalling and did grass maintenance and all those kind of things that people do when they start out. And um, then when I got those tools, I went to McMaster University's reference area. Somebody had collected, I think it was George um, Wallace, uh, who was the head of the department, collected books with wood engravings in them. There were a couple of books on how to. Most of them were novels. And the ones that I liked the most, or I was impressed with the most, were the Leica camera catalogs that were illustrated with wood engravings. Camera parts illustrated with wood engravings. It was fantastic. Um, at any rate, I was looking along this particular shelf, and I saw the spine of a book, and I thought that a little bell went off, and I pulled it down, and it was Wuthering Heights. And uh, this is uh, Heathcliff holding a tree up in a storm. Anyway, so Eichenberg has been something that uh, is deep, is a deep uh, source for me, I think. Joan Hassel. Um, can you, is that one showing up properly? Good. Um, Joan Hassel, I think, is uh, Thomas Buick reincarnated. Um, her work is... Uh, is, is uh, a marvel, and she works on a, such a scale um, that, uh, that you can hardly believe that she could engrave these little faces. I just want you to understand that this illustration is not much bigger in real life than a business card. It's a very small illustration. And all that detail and the expression that she was able to accomplish is re quite remarkable. Now she, uh, Eichenberg, uh, I should get gives dates. I'm trying to be scholarly here. Um, in 1901 he was born and he died in, in uh, 1990. And um, I just wish I had known that he was still alive. I would have made the pilgrimage. Uh, Joan Hassel was born in 1906 and she died in 1988. After I'd seen Eichenberg I would have gone and visited her. And uh, Agnes Miller Parker, born in 1895, died in 1980. Um, I don't engrave at all like her. I am just in awe of her work. And um, it doesn't take me very much to make me humble, but whenever I need it, I go and look at her work. And then, um, born in 1943, Simon Brett, um, British wood engraver. He's sort of the... How would we, how would we describe Simon, George? He's, he's probably the most gentlemanly person I have ever met. He's, he's a grand human being. And um, anyway, I, I really admire his work too. So getting back to the theme here, um, again, it's the white that tells the story because of the, that's how the lines are made. But Simon has a most uncanny ability to make his images feel colorful to me. It's not just content. He's got a, his way of manipulating textures and uh, you, the use of black as it's, you know, for its own self is, is very, very good. So now I'm going to start on with some of mine. That's not Varsol in the bottle either. So. Um, <laughs> the, um, uh, this is one of my earlier engravings, not the earliest one. Um, and I was uh, just ex trying to uh, experiment and, and, and trying to uh, join in with the, uh, the gang at the Ways Goose in Grimsby that happens every year for the last 40-something years. And um, so this was, uh, this was one that attracted the attention of some of my, my peers there. And um, it's uh, mildly reminiscent of my studio. <laughs> Oh, good, this one worked out. Um, then after I'd been at it for about uh, 10 years, uh, Tim Ingster at Porcupine's Quill said that I should uh, have a book of my engravings. And so uh, Tim's a very persuasive guy when he needs to be, and so there it is. Um, this was the engraving I did for the cover. And we called it the point of the graver, and that's the tool that you see down the side that's freeing the foot of the, one of the last dancers there. I brought this along. Um, um, 
because the, the, the uh, costume became a real interest of mine uh, as, because there's so much opportunity to make texture and line and so on. Um, and this was an earlier one, and that's what the cover of the book looked like. Tim, Tim's not such a, a stalwart on the color of black or the color of white. He had to add color to it. He said, we've got to sell books. Now this was one that I, um, a lot of this, uh, many of the pieces that I'm bringing tonight are from books. This was one that was just for the sake of it. Um, the Comedy de l'Arte is, a, is a, an art form that has interested me and I've played around with it in many different mediums in painting and drawing and wood engraving. Um, this, this, this is not meant to be an historical representation of a Comedy de l'Arte troupe. This is a, sort of the dress up trunk version of it. I worked with a model for six years, and we um, and uh, she would go to um, the um, um, clothing the used clothing stores, and she'd come back with different bits of clothing. We'd make costumes out of them, so we would just call it dress up trunk, comedy de l'arte, which I think would be sort of fits the form of comedy de l'arte. I take on commissions, so um, this is uh, a commission from. Um, a um, artist's, uh, a writer's uh, representative for Jan Martel. Um, I was surprised to find out that he, at the time that I did this, he was living in Saskatoon. <laughs> he was teaching at the university there. And uh, just the, the fellow who wrote The Life of Pi, I didn't ever think he'd end up in Saskatoon. <laughs> anyway, apparently it went over well. They said that their wheelbarrow of books was just a little bit bigger than the one that I portrayed. And then uh, for Porcupine's Quill, I, I had a lot of fun working on the Casanova in Venice. And so the, the job of the illustrators that are here tonight um, is to uh, try and evoke the periods or, or the, the spirit of the book, of course. You have to kind of be in there with that. And it was fun to do the research for this. I wish I could have gone to Venice to do it, but I had to do it through the internet. Um, there was, um, uh, but one of them had to, had to uh, illustrate the um, Casanova and one of the other prisoners, when they escaped from the, um, and they, they didn't go through the Bridge of Sighs, they climbed across the top of it to get on top of the Doge's palace, which was covered in lead, uh, lead tiling. But I wanted, I didn't obviously have any way of knowing, so I, I used a, a, tra a, a tourist map to try and sort of put a pinpoint on where I thought they would be on the roof and what the sight lines might be. And it was really fun to do that. I have no idea if it was right, but it felt it was fun. This was a book, um, so uh, the relevance of wood engraving in today's world, that's often a topic amongst uh, our gallery um, owners, for one thing, and for between amongst the wood engravers ourselves. I mean, we all like to think we're relatives because we, we pay our taxes and get up every day. but. Um, the, um, I, w I got a call from um, Harper Collins um, asking to do a book of Timothy Finley's. Uh, when they were leaving their home, he and Bill Whitehead, when they were leaving their home up in Cannington, um, Stone Orchard, uh, they wanted to do a book and they wanted wood engravings. And I had to make them repeat it back to me a couple of times. I said, are you sure you want wood engravings because of the timelines? And they said, no, nope, that's what we want. So that was really a, a fun project. You don't get to do wood engravings so often for um, the commercial trade. I, I work in another medium called scraper board, which was invented in the late 1800s, near the end of the of the Victorian period, to to imitate wood engraving. So, but it's a calligraphic process, and um, you can you can work a lot more quickly. How am I doing for time? Okay. Um, so, um, um, Pierce mentioned uh, uh, Wendell Berry. Uh, Wendell Berry, I've been a, a devotee of Wendell Berry's for about, uh, my daughter's 43 now, so about 40 years. <laughs> and um, he's an American writer. He's a farmer, uh, but he's also a writer. He's been farming this particular, in, on this particular farm for over 50 years, and he's got more than 50 books to his credit uh, in that time period. So I guess he can write and drive horses at the same time, or something like that. Um, 
But I was really, really wanting to uh, somehow be connected to him, so I, I bought the copyrights to eight of his poems, and I published them under my own imprint, which is West Meadow Press. And um, I didn't actually get the whole project finished all at once. And I was at a book fair in Newcastle, Delaware, the Oak Knoll Book Fair. And I met a, a fellow there from Kentucky. His name is Gray Zeitz. And uh, in a room like that, you've got uh, the Fleece Press, uh, Rampant Lion Press, um, um, Whittington Press, all kinds of the big names, the big guns, Burden Bull Press, uh, uh, Barbarian Press, all those big, big hitters were there. And in some cases, they only had one book on their table, and others maybe had five or six. And it was a, it was a place where they actually had pennies in their penny loafers. And um, it was that kind of a place. Washington slept there, too. And um, anyway, uh, in the corner was a, a fellow who actually had bookcases, and they were full. And he, he had so many that he couldn't broadside them. They had to be spying out. So I was looking at along the spines, and I, I start seeing Wendell Berry, Wendell Berry, Wendell Berry. So I, I kind of got excited, and I said to him, I said, do you know Wendell Berry? And he says, he lives across the river from me. So I ran out to the car, because I hadn't brought, I was, what I was down there to do was trying to get some illustration work. So I was going around introducing myself and peddling my wares. And so I ran out, but I didn't bring this in because it wasn't finished. So I ran in and got my, uh, my Wendell Berry engravings out, and the fellow looked at them. And he said, well, you should show those to Wendell. And I just, I laughed. I said, oh, yeah, sure, that's going to happen. And I get a letter from him about three weeks after I got home, and he says, I talked to Wendell about it, and he'd love to see it. So I just got really busy and finished the other four engravings, and, and uh, eventually I was able to take him a copy, so I got to meet him. And um, so that's one of the things that wood engravings done for me, too. I, I had no idea that, it, that working in this medium would ever have that kind of opportunities. Um, this was a frontispiece I did for um, the, the Calypso story from the Odyssey. And, um, and this, I did this, oh, maybe 25 years ago. Um, and then I read the new translation by Emily Wilson. And she's the first woman to ever translate the Odyssey. And it's fantastic. So now I'm working on my version, which is going to be <laughs> a wordless version of the, of the Calypso story in the Odyssey. And she's, it's a, if you haven't picked it up, it's a really good read. And here we are with uh, what I call a book monster. Um, and this is how I was uh, first met uh, David. Um, he's very interested in monsters. And right up here, if you haven't already seen it, there's an amazing exhibition of monsters in books. Um, this is not a monster in the same sense that David understands the matter. This is just playfulness. But I was really felt vindicated because when uh, my wife and I got to go to Florence and we were in um, the library in San Lorenzo, the Laurentian Library, and in the stained glass windows, uh, the, where I sort of picked up the idea of this creature, there was, there was quite a number of them there. It's one of the sort of re Renaissance decorative little creatures. They used it as a motif in all kinds of places. But there it was in the, in the library that Michelangelo made the stairs for. And here's what I did with it. Yeah. People say, why isn't it strange? But this is my friend Gray from Kentucky, so I get to do portraits from time to time. This was a portrait for his 40th anniversary of his press called Larkspur Press. And this was my first, now, now we're getting back to color <laughs> um, in the regular sense. Um, gallery owners um, are... Um, a little bit shy of things that are just what they would say just black on white and especially when they're only the size of business cards there's uh, there's a um, an economics that works backwards when you do that because the frames cost five or six times as much as the engraving does and it's pretty hard to get ahead so uh, working in color I thought well maybe I could join the, the rest of the gang and get some color so this was my first colored engraving after you know 40 years of engraving and uh, and it was it was lots of fun. This was for a book on auto, on on the um, Audubon. Uh, there was a set of sonnets on Audubon. Now I'm just going to run through these quickly here, so that we don't take up too much time. Um, people ask me how I do this. Well, this would be what a general notion of a of a sketch for a for an engraving. 
and there the sketch was transferred to the block and what you're seeing on top there is the very first proof. We'll see a better copy of it in a minute. Here we go. This is what the first proof. So I, I work in, when I work with color, I work as I did when I was doing the Japanese, traditional Japanese method of working. I make the key block first and the key block has all of the information. It has all of the drawing. It's, it's what the, it tells us all the story. And the color blocks are just added in behind. They're pretty much flat color. And then I would, and this is how I work out the color design. This is just pencil crayon on top of one of the proofs of the color block, or the key block, I should say, trying to figure it out. I did this when I was in the hospital, uh, this particular color represented when I was uh, in the hospital having a, had a heart attack. <laughs> but the deadline was still there, so the, the nurses <laughs> the nurses were great. They, uh, they, they would come in and check on me, make sure I wasn't staying up all night and on these things. So it was, it was kind of fun. It was actually one of my first real holidays in many, many, many years. <laughs> I have never, I've never had three weeks with nothing else to do but my own work. It was, it was blast. Um, and the color blocks are, are, are cut from the key blocks. Um, so the, the, the key block image is transferred to uh, the color blocks, which are, are cut to the same size as the key block so that when the press is set up with the key block, you just take it out and put the other color block, put a color block in and it's already pretty much registered. And then, for instance, in the lower right, that was one of the pink colors from this image that you're gonna see. So everything that wasn't gonna be pink gets removed and everything that's not gonna be green gets removed and everything that's not gonna be red gets removed. And then you print them in sequence. And uh, when you get them all printed, here's one I'm registering uh, one of the pinks against the uh, against one of the proofs of the key block. They've all, I've already printed the yellow on it, so I'm getting a, a couple of extra colors here. I'm getting one one uh, one pink and one sort of orangey pink because the yellow and pink mix, and then vice versa. You get an orangey, a yellowy orange in the other one. So that's registering one color against the key block, and then when all the colors are printed, that's what they look like. It looks kind of ho hum, and you have to sort of guard yourself from getting disappointed in your seven or seven or eight hours of straight printing um, to get that far. And then when you print the key block on top of it, this is what happens. You get that. So the key block is where um, it's not using, we're not using pigment color, but the key block has its own sense of color and its own relationships to the design and the weight of line and so on. And then the most, one of the most re or more recent things that's happened to me, and again, that's uh, having to do with Wendell Berry. I got commissioned to do 14 engravings for a, a documentary film on Wendell. And um, that, was a, that was an interesting thing too. So having to work with production people in the film industry, they want, they want uh, uh, images that have a way for the camera to move around in them. So you have to talk to the produce, production people a lot and uh, work out different compositions and, and so on. And they wanted one engraving uh, uh, to show a trees growing and then being cut down. And I thought, well, that's going to be a lot of engravings. He says, no, I've got, I've got computers with all kinds of stuff. He says, just give me the stumps and just give me the, the full trees. So I had to do two engravings like that. And he says, I'll make it happen. And, and it was pretty interesting how they did it. And that one looks like this. And uh, again, you have, to, you have to understand that the actual image is only about that high. In the, in the real world. So um, that's, and the, and the, and the documentary is called Look and See. Uh, it's, a, it's a documentary portrait of Wendell Berry. And it's been quite a bit of uh, fun over the years to have the reaction of people. That, uh, it was is at the um, Sundance, it was at the Berlin Film Festival, it's here at Hot Docs, it's at uh, Southwest, South by Southwest Film Festival. <coughs> and the New York Film Festival, so it went, did the rounds, and now it's on Netflix. <laughs> so anyway, that's um, um, the, the, the lecture, uh, as I understand it, it was to be, it was for the book arts, so I really believe that wood engraving is one of the, the premier arts that, it, that uh, works for books, and like I said before, I think it's the fact that it's a white line image next to images that are black line and they really do marry very well, I think. So I just want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.
Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes, sir. I use maple uh, wood. Um, oh, it's hard. The, the two characteristics of, of the wood that works best for wood engraving are hard and dense. And uh, people often say, well, what about oak? Well, oak is hard, but it is not dense. And uh, amongst wood engravers, I think it's pretty much agreed that the, the best wood would be boxwood, which is very hard and very dense and uh, very expensive and hard to get <laughs> nowadays. Um, I, I use maple. Uh, the way I engrave, I mean, I, I wouldn't know where, how to put myself, but I, if you were on a scale of 1 to 10 of the, um, the fineness of the lines engraved, I, I would not be a 10. Um, there are, there's a, uh, a British engraver by the name of Howard Phipps. Is that how you sign his name? Anyway, Phipps. He's, I would say, a 10 in regards to the delicacy of his engravings. And then um, we all know, uh, or many of us know, about Eric Gill, who, who did single black line engravings. So he'd be the extreme of the open kind of engraving. And I'm somewhere, I mean, if I could be so bold, I would say I'm in, I'm in the sort of the seven, maybe an eight some days in regards to the, the fineness. So I can work in maple. Um, because it'll hold those kind of lines, but um, boxwood will hold much finer lines. Anything else? Yes, sir. How long did it take? Um, uh, I worked on this particular one for a, over a period of two weeks. Now, I don't engrave for eight hours a day, um, and, uh, and I, I, I kind of actually like this. I used to have a hard time answering this question, but I kind of like this question now because... It, uh, when, it, when I have students, uh, they're, they're, they want to rush at this kind of thing. The thing about wood engraving, the way I describe it to people, it's somewhat like a chess game. You can, you, your first gambit is somewhat, possibly you can recover from it, right? You can, you can make something that was intended to be um, a dog and you can make it into a flower if you need to. Because if you've got time, you've got wood left. But then there's a middle game involved where you work all over the block to try and get things happening. And then there's the end game. And the end game can sneak up on you very quickly sometimes. And sometimes it's just agony. It goes on forever. So, but in between the engraving, there's the looking at the, at the proofs. And that sometimes can take days. <laughs> you put it on the wall and you're thinking, how am I going to get myself out of this? Um, and, and the last part, the end game, is, uh, is, a, is more or less just a balancing of the tones. You can only add light. So, um, where you ha so you've already established your absolute blacks and you've played around in the big open areas and, and in the middle tones. But now you've, ha you've got to be very careful that you don't go beyond uh, what, what, where it should be. So, so in those two weeks... Um, there was, it was probably, I, tack, I sometimes tape it to the side of my door into my studio so that I see it all the time. You know, I can't get away from it. <laughs> so, yes, George? Wes, you, you said you were a seven or eight. I, I was hoping you were going to say you were a nine. <laughs> that means that I'm a five. So <laughs> seven, eight, a five and I'm wondering if you could uh, speak a little bit about the, the lining tool, because I don't think you ever use one. No. A, a lining tool at all. And I use the lining tool in, in my work. Other engravers use it too. Yeah, it's a it's a tool to get fine detail quickly, um, but it, it can be overused, like in the case of a Yeah, so you're talking about a multiple lining tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a, just for those who may not know. Uh, it, most of the tools will create one line at a time, but a multiple tool will will create two. And sometimes I think the the one I've seen is the most was seven. And um, it requires an enormous amount of skill to make all those seven points um, um, play together. Um, so um, I, I, it's a, it has a very nice effect. Um, and, I, and it was designed, I think, originally to do, if you think of a Victorian engraving, think of um, uh, Gustave Doré, for instance. There are cloud scenes in the backs of some of his things that are, are quite remarkable because how in heck did they engrave those lines so easily parallel to each other? Um, and that's because they did it with a multiple line tool. 
And um, as far as I know, the, in those engraving shops, those people were experts in it. Not just everybody wielded one of those things. Um, so why don't I use one? I don't know. I, um, I, I've never got the knack, and I think I'm, um, I'm just kind of a one-line kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. But it has, it has a great effect. It's, it's, it, to me, in, in a way, it's like using white Conte when you're working on tone paper with charcoal or something. And if you want something to sparkle, you know, you just give it a little go with the multiple tint tool just like you would with Conte. Yes, sir? A multi-point tool must be, especially if the, if the spacing is quite close, must be real you know, work with someone to sharpen. Now, there you go. <laughs> That's a good reason not to use one, I'll tell you. <laughs> Um, sharpening um, uh, is, is a, uh, you know, we never talk about that, but that's the elephant in the room, really, when, when you're working, because um, I had a, a fellow who's been engraving for 10 years call me up and say, I, I'd like to come and, and uh, uh, work under your, under your uh, watchful eye for a weekend. And uh, I was kind of surprised because, you know, a after a certain while, there's, there's not much you can show somebody who knows what they're doing, right? And he says, I can't get parallel lines, and curved parallel lines in particular. So I said, well, come on over. So he did. And um, after a while, I was watching him engraving. And, um, I mean, en engraving should be, well... I, we haven't got time for me to rhapsodize all night, so I won't get too far. But engraving, when, the, when it's doing really well, is not, there's very little effort. It's all about your thinking in the line. This poor fellow, he was, he was digging. He was sculpting the block. And I said, stop, 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 and give me, uh, let's see your tool. And the face of the tools must be absolutely flat because it's the outside edge of the face, the perimeter of the face of the tool that's actually the cutting edge. And his were domed. They were shiny. They were beautiful. But they were not sharp. There was no edge. And of course he couldn't control the tool. So we just changed the whole thing. We weren't going to talk about composition or how to make a wavy line and all things. We were just going to sharpen. So for two days, we sharpened his tools. And I still get a wave across a room from him every time I see him. <laughs> because he knows how to sharpen his tools now. So it's, uh, but those multiple tools would be really difficult. What yeah. metal are these tools made of? Um, they're a, um, a, a kind of carbon steel. I don't know a lot about the metal, but they're, they're, um, they're like, like a, they would be similar to um, uh, the, the metal of a very high quality carving knife. Um, they're, they're steel, they're not, um, they're carbon steel, they're not um, stainless steel or anything like that, no. Very much like chisels, just the same kind of metal that a chisel's made out of. Yes, sir? From the Sublime to the Ridiculous, yeah. is the, has anyone made a movie of you doing this? <laughs> well, in a, uh, okay. well, I, well, actually, I, there have been several small little video documentary or video things made. But if you see the movie Look and See, the Wendell Berry documentary, I, I was not uh, aware that they were going to do this. But there's a, the whole, uh, at the end of the movie when all the credits are running, they've, they were, they've got me engraving in behind all that. But the, uh, the uh, production manager sent me a, he said, we would want in, they were wanting to put some of the engraving in the in the film, they, you know there are it's a it's a wonderful film. It's got uh, landscapes and it's got voiceover Wendell reading poetry and talking, and they wanted to sort of insert little bits of this. There's a fellow who makes stools and he's shown hammering a stool together, and they wanted to have me engraving, and I said, well, okay, um, it's not like sword fighting or anything like that, you know. It, it's uh, it's a, it's a different approach. So um, they sent me a camera. It was a very high-end uh, phone thing. You know, it looked like a phone. And a, tri a little tripod. And he, he explained quite carefully how he wanted me to set it up on my engraving table. And he says, on this one particular engraving, before you start, I want you to film for five minutes and then engrave some more. And then later on that day, film for another five minutes. And after a while, I had about two hours of five-minute sections of me engraving. And I thought they were going to maybe use, you know, 10 seconds of one of those things.
but they're, they put them all together in their, on their website. And there's two whole hours of this. <laughs> now, I'd rather watch paint dry than watch a, than watch a wood engraver engrave. <laughs> I mean, for the engraver, it's it's a thrill. I mean, you're like you're you're right on the point of that tool, and uh, you know if you if you want, you know maybe that's why I had a heart attack. I don't know, but um, if you want a thrill, just try not to make a mistake in a, in a piece of wood. Yes. Take heart. There are still people buying wood engravings and willing to pay more for them than they pay for the frame. I've had the good fortune in the last few months to acquire two Agnes Miller Parkers, oh. three Joan Hassels, oh, you. and yeah. several other wonderful pieces, yeah. Monica Poole, yeah. Sarah Van e. Kirk, yeah. and there, there are still collectors around, yeah. and um, people are getting good money for those pieces. Yes, they are, and, and uh, my compliments to you for the ones you're collecting. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's definitely... Um, I think people in the know understand, and um, and it took me many years to, to understand it myself. But the, you know, the, the the straightforward, the pure. Uh, it's kind of a loaded word, but it's not pure in in some senses. But it's um, the the intensity, the the focus that it takes to produce a wood engraving is. Um, some there are, are authors that out there that say that it it's the, one of the most difficult mediums to work in. One more, or yeah, one, two, two, one more question. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, you didn't really use the word composition very much, but you must spend a lot of time working on that. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Composition. Composition is. A, 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 it, it, yeah. It's printmaking in general is a is a drawing medium. So uh, drawing is is absolutely essential. I mean, however, I mean, people draw in many ways. And what I tell people that want to come and study is I say that if you're if you're comfortable drawing, then this will this will be something that will be less troublesome to take on. Um, composition, like the the illustrators that illustrate all these books up here, they have to have read the text and they have to have absorbed it something in some ways and done the research for costumes or for landscape or for some kind of uh, relevance to the to the text. So. Uh, yeah, composition is a big deal. A problem. Yeah. I'm sorry. But anyway, okay. One, one last question, then we, we've got treats out here, so we've got to get to that. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I know Rosemary, and th those those are are just uh, um, I don't know the the Sistine Chapel of wood engraving. There, it's just amazing. I know the people that were printing them for that exhibition, and uh, they it was quite the project to print a block that large. And uh, I remember talking to Rosemary once about bringing a block. Those came from England, those blocks, and the humidity changes and something. Just the the fragility of the wood. It was amazing that they didn't break up. You know, but uh, no, she's a remarkable uh, engraver. Yeah, I'm glad they're doing that. And and uh, and thanks for the reminder. If you if you're at all interested in wood engraving and especially Rosemary's work, go to Hamilton Art Gallery. Thank you very much. Thanks all.